Uh, thank you very much, folks. Uh, I'm here to, to talk to you about Robert Blair Main. You will probably call him Paddy, okay? Um, I call him Blair because the family call him Blair and, and I've known the family. I've been lucky enough to know the family for a long time. Now, I dare say the majority of you here have always heard about Blair and you know a little bit about him. I'm kind of hoping that at the end of this, this talk, you maybe know couple of wee news stories, okay, um, and uh, thank you all for coming. So, um, if we start off, so you've all been to Newton Ards, I hope, and if anybody hasn't been to Newton Ards, take a wee scoot over there now, um, because you'll see a statue, a statue just not to anybody in particular, but a statue to Blair, um, Robert Blair Main, to give him his full name. Beside it, there's a wee cafe called Colonel Paddy's. Well worth going in there. They have some fantastic stuff. Um, but anyway, that's my daughter standing in front. She's now about almost the height of them. I'll give you an idea of how many years I've been doing this talk, for dear sake. So, um, who was Robert Blair Main? That you'll probably all call Paddy. Um, but continue doing that, because that's fine. This is a nice wee picture of him. Okay, taken in the desert at the time of the war. Now, maybe you didn't know that he was actually a British lion, as in the rugby team. He was also secretary to the Law Society of Northern Ireland. He was a solicitor. He was a champion golfer, for dear sake. Um, did you know he was an Antarctic explorer? That's something that will come out in the next wee while because we have his journals from when he, he was actually second in command down to Antarctica. Um, so anyway, he is simply a legend. And it's a legend that, that we in Northern Ireland should be intensely proud of, okay? Um, two lovely pictures of Blair. One picture taken, this one here, um, when he was in Mount Pleasant, taken by Bob Bennett. Those in the, who have sort of researched um, the SAS, wartime SAS, will know the name Bob Bennett, very good friend of Blair's. And the other one taken at Highlands House, okay, over in Cheltenham. And uh, you'll notice he's wearing a light coloured beret in this one. Uh, and that's because it was a sandy coloured beret. And Blair loved it because it reminded him of the early days of the SAS, okay. Um, later on in the war, the army sort of tried to instill some discipline on, on this band of brigands and, uh, and gave them a maroon berry. But Blair refused to wear the maroon berry. He liked the sandy colored berry and woe betide anybody who would try and take it off his head. Anyway, so he was born 1915, the 11th of January, would have been 109 years of age. And this is where I'm gonna ask you guys because I'm a teacher, remember, um, I want you to try and tell me which one do you think was Blair? Okay, pram, baby, all those. I'm just going to move this over a bit because uh, my eyesight's not as good as it used to be or, or was. Okay, so we've got the pram so far. I do this talk to primary school kids, to secondary school kids and probus groups and all this sort of stuff. And um, when you get the primary school kids, it's great. See the girl at the front? No, I don't think you're getting this. It's, no, that's not Blair, no. Um, okay. Well, you all went straight for the baby in the pram and you were all dead on. Okay, they say from tiny little acorns, huge oaks grow. And really, that photograph pretty much shows that that's the case, okay? There was one more main still to come and that was his younger brother, uh, Douglas, or Doogie, as he was known in the family. And he was a dentist around Newton Arts. And it's thanks to him, and also thanks to his daughter, Fiona, that we have all the information that we have about Blair, because they looked after it, okay, and they protected it. Um, so uh, you, you'll hear a bit more about that later on. So, he was the last man born in the family home. Now, most people think that the family home was Mount Pleasant. But when Blair was born, the family home was actually in the center of Newton Ards. Mount Pleasant was their home in the country, would you believe? 
very fancy looking house. It's about 500 yards away from their other house that they all lived in and that Blair was born in. As soon as Blair was born, the family moved full time up to Mount Pleasant and Dougie was the only main child born in, in Mount Pleasant. Okay. Um, do you know that house in Newtonards? Have you seen it? It's now surrounded by houses. So if you're, if you're ever coming to Newtonards, and I am serious about this, give me a shout. I'd take you on a wee Blair, all points Blair tour. Um, and I'll take you and show you all the places where he was born, where he went to primary school and all that sort of stuff. So please don't be afraid to, to give me a shout. Um, we will be producing a map at some stage so that you can do this on your own. It all starts off at Colonel Paddy's and at the statue. Okay. But anyway, so moving on. He was educated at the original Regent House School. Anybody from Regent House here? Really? Fantastic. Great. I'll not slag them off, no. Um, I used to teach in the high school in Newton Arts, so, uh, so there was always, a, not a rivalry as such, but we were always looked down upon by the ones at Regent. Um, I think Regent is a fantastic school because both my daughters go there now, and uh, we are trying to, to bring out the, the Blair. But um, when you went to school, I'd say it would be in the new, where, where the school is at the present moment in time. This is where Blair went here, okay? And you might recognize it because it's uh, beside the bus station in Newton Arts. Okay, it was for a while Sam Germain for a bargain. And what's even better is there's now a cafe in it called the Regent Tea Room. And if you have a, a vested interest in Blair and, and like a really, you want to, to sort of touch with the man, go and get yourself a cup of tea in the classroom that he would have sat in. It was one of my proudest moments was sitting with his niece in his classroom, having a cup of tea. Um, just, you can't, you, you can't buy stuff like that. So it was fantastic. So make sure you go and have a wee look in Newton Ards. So this was a man who was exceptionally good from a very young age at sport. He really enjoyed his sport. He was exceptionally good at shooting, which he did from the house, from inside the house at the pigeons and um, the vermin that was outside. Uh, and he used to shoot from inside the house at the, uh, the rabbits and things like that. He was an exceptionally good shot, by the way. Um, but he also enjoyed his rugby, his golf. He played at Scrabble and also um, Kirkubbin, uh, amongst others. And he was also under 21 university champion boxer. Now, the man was exceptional because when he first tried boxing out, he knocked out the guy who was sparring with him um, and didn't know an awful lot about the, the, the old boxing stuff. But to become under 21's boxing champion, you'll see why in a later photograph because he was a big lad, six foot two and a half in his stock and soles, um, with hands like spades, honestly. Uh, and, and plenty of strength. Not the big muscly Arnold Schwarzenegger stuff, just pure bred strength. Anyway, so I'm going to ask you to identify some of the rugby teams that he would have played from or played for, okay? And I'll try and give you a wee bit of information about some of them as we go along. So if we start in the top left hand side with the black one, you can have a guess what R8 stands for. In fact, you can tell me straight away. Regent House, correct. Okay, if we work our way anti-clockwise, below you've got Ard's Rugby Club. Captain at 18 years of age, and considering he would have been captain of people who were in their 20s, and possibly just virgin on their 30s, that is some achievement for a young buck, you must admit. Below that, anybody identify this crest here? Queen's, Queen's University, spot on. So he played for the Queen's team, 37-38 team. Okay, let's work our way across. Malone? Yep, it's easy one, that one. Can anybody tell me why he played for Malone? Well, what, what did he do for a living? He was a solicitor and apparently, now, I think this is slightly wrong, but apparently if you're a solicitor, you have to play for Malone. Um, it's, uh, yeah, anyway. <laughs> so, above that, Ulster. Okay, stand up for the, no, don't stand up for the Ulster men, it'd be all confusing. Ireland, 
and then in the centre, the pinnacle of rugby at that time, in fact the pinnacle of rugby at any time, is to play for the British Lions. They weren't called the British Lions in those days, they were called the British Isles Rugby Football Touring Team. Okay, can you imagine the size of the badge that they had to, to put on there? So he played for them as well. Um, and he played in the infamous 1938 Tour of South Africa. Um, infamous for not just what happened on the pitch, but also what happened off the pitch. And I'll tell you a couple of stories about those. So we have, oh, wrong button there. Nice wee picture here of the 37-38 Queens team. And you'll notice Blair there sitting beside the minister, okay, on the right-hand side. Now, on the other right-hand side um, of Blair this time, there's another chap there who's called Cole. He was Dr. Cole. And um, maybe do you know Dr. Cole or know of Dr. Cole? He was, he was kind of like one of the number one doctors in Newton Ard. Um, his daughter is a, a, a lady called Barbara Coffey, okay, and... Uh, as mentioned earlier, I used to, I, I helped Damien Lewis write some of his books. Now, when I say you helped them, the man wrote the books and I sort of went, no, it's Regent House, not Regent House. You know, that's the sort of help I gave. Um, but, uh, but I like to say I helped him, you know. Um, but Damien said to me, Peter, people accuse Blair Main of being a psychopath. What, what is... What is the general feeling on that? And I went straight to Barbara Coffey and I said, Barbara, your dad was one of Blair's best mates. And somebody says, he's a psychopath. What's your opinion on that? And she said, leave it with me. And I thought, I'm gonna have a three page thesis here or something like that, fantastic. She wrote a paragraph. Initially, I was disappointed until I read it. And she said, my father was, was one of Blair's best friends. When my mother and father wanted a night out without us children, they asked Blair to look after us and my parents would not leave me in the charge of a psychopath. <laughs> She's entirely right. The man loved children. He was surrounded to a certain extent up in Mount Pleasant with the children. When he finished with the war and all that stuff. He wanted to set up a school to teach wayward lads how to, you know, how, how, all, all the trades. That's what he wanted to do. And he never got the chance to, but anyway. So on the other side of the minister, we have another minister. Now he wasn't a minister in that photograph, a man called George Cromie. And George Cromie was something special. George Cromie was about five foot two. Amber Blair was about six foot two and a half, you know. So I'm five foot three, because I know Mrs. Uh, uh, and I know the Cromies would complain to me. Now, George went on tour with Blair to South Africa. And while he was in South Africa, he became an ordained Presbyterian minister. And guess what the, the management of the lions, we'll call them lions now because you know who we're talking about. Guess what they did to try and calm Blair down a wee bit? They bumped him with George, a Presbyterian minister, to try and calm him down. Well, you decide whether it did work or not. Anyway, so that's the 37-38 the Queens team and there's quite a few faces that actually went on and played for the lions. There's the, the two caps of the lines. Those are modern caps, by the way. This one was George Cromie's, and that one's uh, Blair's. That's now in the Leisure Centre in Newton Ards, the Blair Main Leisure and thingy, Ards Leisure Centre, as we all call it still. But anyway, um, so you can have a look. The family donated it to them. So, I'd said I'd mention a couple of stories, okay, about the, the Lions Tour of South Africa, the infamous Lions Tour. I'm going to mention one on the pitch and one off the pitch, okay? So, the first one on the pitch. The captain of the Lions at the time was a, a chap called Sammy Walker. Sammy Walker was from Belfast. Sammy was a lovely fella. He played in the front row, okay? Everybody adored him, and he was a fantastic leader. 
On one match, they were playing against Western Transvaal. Now, you've got to remember, South Africans. Are there any South Africans in the room before I make this comment? I made this comment before, and there was a South African guy before. South Africans, when it comes to rugby, are very, very brutal, probably would be the best. You know, they, they don't like to lose. They also don't like to big up anybody who's not South African. On this particular tour, as I said, Sammy was captain of the, the, uh, the Lions team and Sammy was tackled rather harshly by this big forward um, on, the, south, on the, the western Transvaal side. He was tackled so harshly it knocked him out. So Sammy was lying on the pitch, clean out, you know, um, and he kind of, there was no head injury things in those days. So Sammy woke up you know, with a Tweety Birds all flying around his head and giving him his head a shake and stuff. Um, he looked over and there were two fellas carrying a stretcher over towards him. And he thought, well, here, I'm all right. So he started shouting, I'm all right, I'm, o- I'm fine, I'm, I'm all right, I'm all right. The uh, boys in the stretcher just ignored him, kept on running towards him. So he propped himself up on his elbow by this stage and he was going, look, I'm fine, I'm fine. Well, the guys arrived up at him and ran straight past him with the stretcher over to the Western Transvaal player who was about 20 feet away, knocked out entirely. At which stage, Sammy's lying there on the ground and Blair walks over to him, kneels down, goes, don't worry, Sammy, it's sorted. (laughs) Blair never started a fight on the pitch, but... Well, he ended all of them. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> now, so that was the wee story on the pitch. There are many, many stories on the pitch, and I would love to have more time to tell you a few, but that'll come. Um, off the pitch, you probably have heard of this story, okay? There was a chap called Jimmy Unwin who played for the Lions, and Jimmy made this throwaway comment, and he threw away his comment that says, you know the problem with this tour? There's no fresh meat. Now, to anybody else, they would just go, ah, you're right, Jimmy. But no, something lodged in Blair's head. No, 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 uh, no fresh meat. So, there was a big high society dinner coming up, and they were all dressed up, all the players were all dressed up, and they were going to meet the hoity-toities of, of South Africa, and, you know, the, the lords and ladies and stuff. Well, there must have been two bars in this particular hotel, one bar where all the, the, the good folk were, and another bar where Blair went. Because he noticed there were a couple of guys standing at the bar with rifles on their backs. So he thought, you know what, I think I'll go and have a wee chat with these boys. And said to the chaps, what's with the rifles? And they said, uh, we're going out lamping into the bush. Now, okay, lamping, shine a torch out. You see a set of eyes, you shoot it, basically. So Blair sort of weighed up the, the, the options. High society dinner, out with these boys shooting things. I'll go with them. And he did. Now again, I said to you that the, the South Africans, well, not, they're not big fans of, of, um, of outsiders doing well, but they were incredibly impressed. They were incredibly impressed at his prowess with a gun of his ability to shoot because he went out with them. Remember, he's in his tux, on horseback, <laughs> rifle over his shoulder, heads out into the bush with them in the dark, sees a set of eyes, and Blair shoots him, and he downs the animal in one shot. And the South Africans were mightily impressed with this. Now, you and I would, would go, yippee, look what I did there, and here, boys, that's you eating for a wee while. But Blair said, I have a purpose for this. So he brought the dead Springbok back to the hotel, up to the room that he was sharing with George Cromie, the Reverend George Cromie. Now, this was at nine o'clock in the morning. He walked through the foyer of the hotel, because hotels aren't busy at nine o'clock in the morning, are they? So anyway, you can imagine the ruckus. So he he knocks on on the, the door for George. George opens the door and says, you're not bringing that in here. And he says, no, 
I've got a purpose for. So he goes down to find Jimmy Unwin's room. Jimmy's still in his bed for, you know, having a wee lie in. It's nine o'clock in the morning for dear sake. Blair doesn't, you know, try doors anymore. He kicks the door in. The noise wakens the whole landing. Everybody's up. What's going on? You know, and they're sticking out their, their heads and stuff. And Blair marches into the room. Jimmy's lying there in his bed, rubbing the, the sleep from his eyes. The next thing, Blair throws a springbok at him. Now, if you know a springbok, it's got these wee fine antlers. And they dug into Jimmy's leg. And Jimmy was out for about three weeks. Now, by this stage, the doorway was just filled with boys going, what's going on here? Blair turns to walk out and somebody says, here Blair, you can't leave that lion there. And Blair says, it's not a lion, it's a spring, no, sorry, he, he doesn't, he doesn't. but it is my daughter's favorite joke. So anyway, Blair says, no, I've got a purpose for this. They realized that one of the lion's players, his room was adjacent to the coach of the spring box. And outside the window, there was a ledge. Now, there's a bigger ledge there. It's about an inch wide. So Blair crawls out the window with a springbok over his shoulder, still in his tux, and hangs the dead springbok on the window of the coach of the South African team. With a little note on it that said, fresh meat. <laughs> now, again, this sounds like pure made-up folklore. So you're going to need some evidence. I'll give you two items of evidence. The first is a copy of George Cromie's diary. Halfway down the page, you'll see. It says, Blair Main supposed to sleep with me, but came in, let me see, a bit under the weather and did not come in until about 9 a.m. when he brought in a book which he had shot. I just love the way George wrote that. Because if you look at the next paragraph, he was just so matter of fact. It says, after breakfast, some of the chaps went and had a picnic. You know, I'm just amazed. This man, this man mountain has just knocked on the door, carrying a dead antelope over his shoulder. And George was, George was an amazingly humble man. Um, he's a good, uh, you know, North Antrim Presbyterian minister. He didn't think anybody would be interested in the fact that he was a, a British lion and he burnt an awful lot of his stuff. Um, one thing he did manage to keep was his, his old lion shirt. And uh, um, his sons used to wear them, wear, wear the shirt out to their rugby practice and they hated it. Because all their mates turned out in these nice new um, rugby jerseys and they turned out in this old blue one because it was the, the lions used to play in blue with this bit of a badge hanging here and they hated it. I said to uh, Mrs Gordon, who is George Cromie's daughter, what did you do with the rugby shirt? That's history. That is pure history. I says, I know it is. I said, so what did you do with it? She says, what everybody does with an old rugby shirt. We cut it up and made dusters out of it. <laughs> oh dear, bless us. Anyway, so, um, so there's the first piece of evidence. And that's the Reverend George Cromie's diary. If you still don't believe me, and I'm sure there's one or two I can tell from looking at you. Here's a photograph of a springbok hanging outside the window of the coach of the springboks. Probably photograph taken by Blair Main. Look at the size of the ledge, by the way. It's about an inch. <laughs> so, you know, anyway. So that's the sort of person that we're dealing with here. You know, he takes, he, he takes Tom Fullery to a whole new level. So here's some pictures from the, the rest of the tour. Uh, these are from uh, George's own collection. All the, all the team got a set of photographs. You'll see Blair sitting at the front on a wicker chair. Um, you'll see Blair on this one over at the far side, just having a wee bit of downtime. One of the things that, uh, that George Cromie's daughter has is a set of cigarette cards, all signed by the team. Um, an amazing piece of, of history. Um, and these were taken. So this is Blair and this is George. Okay, but this is my favorite photograph because does anybody know the significance of, um, of those eight men? 
That's good. They're the Irish ones, correct. They're all the Irish players. Now, I want you to do a wee bit of maths. I told you at the start I'm a maths teacher. Right, how many is on a rugby team? 15. Okay, how many Irish? Eight. Over half the team. So we'll just leave it at that, and then we'll come back to that in a second or two. Okay? Now, you'll see some of the faces up there. You'll see Blair over here. You'll see George Crummy just above me here. Sammy Walker just um, on, on his side there. Uh, Bob Alexander, Harry McKibben. You might know some of these names if you're into classic rugby and, and Ulster and things like that. But that's the eight Irish players, okay? So, you know what they say, never underestimate the Irish on a rugby pitch? Certainly now, it's, it's great. So there were three test matches against the South African team, okay? And in the first test, the South Africans beat them. Okay, the team consisted mainly of English, Scots and Welsh. You know the way they do. Okay, there was a smattering of Irish players. Blair was playing, George was playing, things like that. Now, I mentioned to you already, South Africans were brutal. Okay, brutal with their rugby. They love their rugby. So by the time the second match came, well, they didn't have quite as many English and Scottish and Welsh and they had to play a few more of the Irish guys. And they were still beaten, okay? Quite convincingly beaten, as you can see from that score. So they come to the last match, and boys are dear, they couldn't make a team unless they played every single Irish player at the same time. All eight of them. Now, let's come back to the maths here. 15 in a team, eight Irish. You could safely say that was an Irish team, couldn't you? Well, that's certainly the way things are at the moment. Um, and guess what? Third test. They won. Happy days. And this, this is where I normally go, you, but I'll not do that. Maybe I will. Anyway, um, so never underestimate the Irish. So I mentioned to you originally about what Blair looked like. His big hands, look at those big hands there. The big reach, you can understand why he was under 21's boxing champion, university boxing champion, right? Nobody would be able to get near him, okay? Big long legs and strength, not Arnold Schwarzenegger muscle strength, just pure bred strength, okay? Now, we're 1938, in fact, 1939, we have the start of the Second World War. Suddenly Blair's playing career and all that sort of stuff comes to an absolute halt. And Blair decides, you know, like all of his mates, I'm going to sign up. Okay? He actually signed up with one of his friends, a guy called Ted Griffith. Ted was a, a teacher at Regent House and had, when Blair left Regent, he needed to brush up on his Latin. So he went back to, to Regent and asked Ted Griffiths, would you teach us a wee bit more of the Latin to get me into law at Queen's? And he and Ted hit it off brilliantly. There weren't, there weren't too many years between them, okay? And when war broke out, Ted actually said, do you know, let's give this a rattle. Not, you know, let's sign our lives, let's, let's fight, let's give this a rattle. So they filled all the forms in, the two of them. And I thought, right, we'll post them. And Blair says, I'll post them, don't you worry. And he stuffs them into his sports jacket. And then he completely forgets about them. And he's down at an international, down south in Dublin, in Jury's Hotel, and he's about to buy a round. And he sticks his hand in his pocket, and he goes, what's these? Pulls out the forms that he and, and Ted had filled in. And he says to the ones in Jury's, could I have an envelope, please? And he said, yep. So he stuffs them into an envelope, addresses them, doesn't put a stamp on it, just posts it. The next week, they're both signed up. That's how, you know when they say, how did you join the army, Dad? No. Anyway, so, so that's, the, that's what Blair decided to do. Now, he had, he joined the territory, sorry, he joined the supplementary reserve to give them their proper name there. Okay, now, this photograph here, when I saw it, I thought that must be Blair in his really, or that's a very young looking Blair there, okay? 
because Blair had actually been in the, the uh, Army Cadets when he was at Regent House. Regent are now famous for their Air Training Corps, okay, which, which the changeover happened in 1951. But while Blair was actually in Queen's University Officer Training Corps, both he and Ted Griffith were sort of noted down as not being officer material, which I think is hilarious. Because you've got to remember what Blair finished the war with. Well, just to give you an idea, Ted Griffith finished with two DFCs, Distinguished Flying Cross. Somebody at Queen's got it wrong. But anyway, we'll not worry too much about that. So Blair joined the, the, the TA, the Supplementary Reserve, um, joined the 5th Light, Light Anti-Aircraft Battery, um, Movilla, Movilla Camp, actually. And that was Royal Artillery. So initially he joined as Royal Artillery and then transferred very quickly to the Royal Ulster Rifles. Okay. Now, the Royal Ulster Rifles all went off to the Middle East um, and left Blair and Ted, um, probably because of the, the, uh, the report that had already been written about them. And Blair thought, you know, I'm not, I don't think this is for me. And then he heard about this group called the Commandos. The 11 Scottish Commandos, to be exact. Remember, Blair was at the top of his, his rugby career, so he was strong, fit, healthy, okay? Um, and he thought, you know, I'll give these Commandos things a rattle. So they went off to the Isle of Arran, and they trained in, in Arran under extreme conditions, okay? And then they he headed over to Litani, Litani River, or Litany River, depending on, on um, which way you want to go. Okay, Blair was, um, was singled out for, he was mentioned in dispatches, he was exceptionally good, his leadership quality started to, to develop considerably. But you will probably have heard the story, and people like to, to tell this story, especially on TV programs that are, are incredibly inaccurate. But anyway, I'll not make any comment about that. Um, that he assaulted his commanding officer, uh, who, who finished the war as Lieutenant Colonel Keyes. Now, it's one of those things, it's a story that people like to tell, that Blair was in prison, ready to be court-martialed and be put out on his ear. Um, and the TV programme, well, they, they visited the odd jail once or twice in, in their um, thing, and, and incorrectly, I would like to point out, because at no point was Blair in a jail. At no point was he going to be um, court-martialed, because he did not attack his commanding officer. He did not assault his commanding officer, no way, Jose. Now, unfortunately, David Sterling, who liked to tell stories and liked stories better sometimes than the truth, said, well, oh, yes, he attacked his commanding officer. And I took him to the side and I said, well, I'm one commanding officer, you will not attack. And he, you know, he stuck to that. Now, you'll notice David Sterling told this story after Blair had died. So <laughs> there was no comeback. Anyway. So Blair never did strike his commanding officer. I'm, I'm sorry, it's, uh, it's just all part of the, uh, the folklore that goes with, with me. And so no striking commanding officer. It was actually the second in command, if you're really going to be technical about it. <laughs> okay. um, it was a guy called Charles Napier. Um, Napier was not terribly well liked. He, uh, um, when, when they were all the way on, on active service, Napier went round the, the camp and um, killed all the, the dogs. Now what he didn't realise was Blair had befriended one of the dogs because he had a dog at home, he missed his dog. There was a wee stray dog running about the place so the men fed it and it became sort of a camp dog and, and Blair was very fond of it. And when Napier decided he was going to put, you know, put an end to the wee dog, Blair didn't take that too well. Now there's loads of stories of how, how the attack actually took place, but I'm not going to get into those because it's hard to pin down which one's actually true. Um, so, here we have proof, if proof were needed, that Blair was never in prison because this is the report and you'll see five lines down from the top. It says, RB Main left the unit. There was no court martial, there was no prison, there was no jail or anything like that. Okay, Blair was leaving because, well, one of two things. He had malaria at this stage and he was in a hospital in Cairo and he, was, he wrote to his mum and said I'm thinking of maybe going over to the Far East and maybe you know, tackling some of the, 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 uh, the stuff there and joining up there. Um, 
because I read the letter. I had the letter in my hand that he wrote. And then it was just when you get to the bit that says, and I have malaria. I was like, whoa, whoa. Anyway, um, so there was no way Blair was, um, was, was hanging about with the, the commandos. He was for heading out. But fortunately for us, and fortunately for, uh, for this country, there was a, a Scottish, young Scottish um, officer by the name of David Sterling who had come up with this idea. He liked the idea of the commandos. But we'll take them, we'll concentrate them. So instead of having um, 30 commandos, we'll have maybe six at the most, and at times three or four. Highly trained, highly motivated, incredibly fit folk who will be able to do any job whatsoever. We'll drop them in behind enemy lines. They will blow the living daylights out of things and disappear into the night. Because it's easier to hold or to, to hide four three or four men than it is to hide 30. Okay. Initially, Sterling was going to call them the parachute unit because they had got a bunch of parachutes and they, they taught themselves how to use them. And I love these photographs of them teaching themselves in the desert without even a plane how to use parachutes. Anyway, he was persuaded um, at a later stage to change the name to L Detachment, the Special Air Service. The name had actually been used previously. Um, was used by one para um, before they became first para, but uh, they didn't like the name. So they gave it up and David Sterling was offered it and he said, I like the sound of this. Can anybody tell me why they chose L detachment, the letter L? Long range. Long range, as in long range desert patrol. That's kind of good, not right, but good all the same. The rest of you, you all know the answer, you just not tell me. Okay, it's all to do with the positioning of the letter L in the alphabet. Where is it roughly? Middle-ish, but not quite the middle. Middle-ish, because they wanted, it was basically a wee sort of diversionary tactic. If any of L detachment were captured by the Germans, and the Germans said, who are you, from? you know, considering the damage that L detachment were doing, they wanted them to say, I'm L Detachment Special Air Service. And they would go, ah, if this is L Detachment, there is A Detachment and B Detachment. And see, that is the worst German accent. <laughs> Certainly the worst you'll hear tonight, but anyway. Um, so, yeah. And this was all going to take place in the deserts of North Africa. Because remember, the deserts of North Africa, whoever controlled that, controlled the Mediterranean. Whoever controlled the Mediterranean, controlled the soft underbelly of Europe etc etc and at this present moment in time it was in the hand of the Axis powers the Germans and Italians so there was a massive push to try and get North Africa back again and Sterling thought you know we could be just a little bit of extra help we could blow up arms dumps we could blow up aircraft we could do that and disappear into the night which is how Sterling got his nickname the Phantom Major because he just appeared and disappeared Okay, just as easily. So, this small group, now we're talking no more than 60. Two of the first members were Ian McGonagall. Ian, not Owen McGonagall like in the TV program when they got that wrong. Okay, Ian McGonagall is the pronunciation the family make. And Blair Main. Ian and Blair were friends from way back, from back in, the, in the, the days of Queens because Ian's brother, Ambrose, played, well, uh, sorry, went to Queens for a wee while, met Blair Main, they got talking, and the families started to get to know each other. And they knew each other well before. It was actually Ian joined the, the SAS before Blair did and talked A, Blair into joining, and B, David Sterling into talking to Blair. So, you have this fledgling organisation consisting of Jock Lewis, okay, Jock was born in India, grew up in Australia, so he was tough. Um, he came over to the UK to work with the, the Oxford boat team, okay, to help them because they were being beaten year after year by Cambridge, so he was the, the training man for the Oxford team, okay. He was also a chemist, he was exceptionally good because he developed a bomb which the men could carry when it came to it. The army gave them these bombs and they could carry about three at a time. They needed more than that. So 
Um, Jock went out into the desert and blew things up and made mixtures until he could find the right mixture that would, um, the men could carry nine bombs each. <coughs> Excuse me. So, you've in the middle, David Sterling, the brains of the organisation, the man with a brass neck. And then you've got over at the far side there, you've got Blair. The only time you'll see me refer to him as Paddy. And Blair was the loyalty of the men. The men knew that immediately he was a talisman to them. If Blair was going into action with them, their chances of survival went straight up. Blair made a point of making sure that his men came back. Blair took it personally if any of his men didn't come back. He was the first one into his tent to write to the parents of that particular man. He was caring, incredibly caring. And that is not something a psychopath would be like. So, anyway, <coughs> I mentioned to you about the whole parachute thing. A bunch of parachutes got delivered to Cairo by mistake and weren't returned. I think it was one of those Amazon deliveries, you know, early Amazon deliveries, I don't get it right. But uh, no offence if anybody works for Amazon here, and I'm not going to tell you my address for the future reference. But anyway, um, so these guys had a bunch of parachutes and they thought, you know, we're going to train ourselves how to use parachutes. No planes, right? Which I just love. Um, these were taken out of the SAS war diary. Fantastic pictures. They got scaffolding in the desert, right? Um, I live a mile and a half away from you here in Newton Ords. I can't get scaffolding. And they got it in the desert. It's actually, um, it was an old railway line that they dug up and they used the, the, um, the railway line to, to make the scaffolding. But I love this last picture here. This is how to learn how to, to land properly. What they did was they got the flatbed trucks and the men jumped off at 30 miles an hour off the back of the truck, right? Now, after the first run, and there was just a big long queue of people who, you know, who needed medical equipment or uh, looking after, um, they knocked the, the speed down to about 15 miles per hour. It's still brave and fast. I love the way they're filming it. And you can actually go on YouTube and you'll see this. This exists. Um, the, the filming, the, the early SAS training. So, all this training, all this, all your special air service and all that stuff, are you going to do anything? And they said, right, we have this thing called Operation Squatter. The idea is very simple. We'll take off in planes, okay? All five planes, about 12 men do a plane. We'll all jump out. You'll drop us behind enemy lines. We'll go to the airfields. We'll blow up the airfields, blow up the aircraft, and then we'll meet back with the long range desert group. That was the plan. Plans are great. Unfortunately, what happened was they took off just as the worst storm in living memory was happening to hit the area. Blair's plane went last. Some of the planes, well, one of the planes was lost in the storm. Never found again. The men jumped out into raging winds going all different directions. The equipment went shooting off one direction. The men went all over the place. They found a couple of things out when they landed. If they landed on their front and sand got in behind the button, that would, the quick release button, it wouldn't work. So the, some of the men who landed on their front were dragged out to their deaths through the, the, the desert. When we think about it, we think of the desert, you know, we think of Malay, well, without the amusements. Um, but it's craggy, it's rocky, there's scrub, there's stones and all that stuff. Some of those men were just flayed alive. Those that weren't killed that way came down, maybe injured themselves, and were immediately captured by the Italians and the Germans. Okay? And you've got to remember, all but one of the SAS guys went on this, um, on this operation, and it was an absolute unmitigated disaster. How many came back? 21 men came back from the 60 odd that went. That's a phenomenal amount, two thirds wiped out, either captured or killed. Um, You'll see the photograph there, fantastic photograph taken by Jake Eason Smith from the Long Range Desert Group. 
There's about 16 fellas there. There's, there's a few who were too injured to get their photograph taken. You'll see David Sterling in the middle with the sunglasses on, and you'll see beside him Blair looking disconsolate, right? And he did, he, he looked that way because he just watched the men that they had trained up just decimated, absolutely. But on a personal level, one of the ones that didn't return was Ian McGonagall. Blair's best mate. McGonagall knew what made Blair tick. They were like brothers. Blair knew that, that if he went out with McGonagall and he was going to go off on one, McGonagall would control him. McGonagall at one point, when Blair was going off on one, took a gun and pointed it at Blair and said, I will shoot you, Blair. And Blair knew rightly he would. And he calmed down. He was like a brother to him. Okay, it was as close as he was going to get. You've also got to remember, Blair was a Protestant Northern Irish man. And McGonagall was a Southern Catholic. So all those people who try and claim Blair as a, you know, a loyalist, no, far from it. If anything, he's what we wanted. Somebody who was happy enough to just talk to anyone. So, Blair was... was Absolutely wrecked when McGonagall went missing. He didn't find out what happened to McGonagall until about 43, a couple of years later, because they didn't have mobile phones and stuff. All of McGonagall's men were either captured or killed. And it was only later in the war when a couple of, of McGonagall's men escaped a prison camp and got back to the SAS that they actually found out what happened to McGonagall. His body has never been found. Um, sad. So. Anyway, that was the first raid. A near complete wipeout of the SAS. So the second raid, well, they had to sort of plan and rethink things. Tell you what, see the way the Long Range Desert Group are going to pick us up after a raid? Well, can they not just leave us there? And that started a brilliant relationship between the Long Range Desert Group and the SAS. The LRDG would take them to where they wanted to go, leave them off, they would cause absolute havoc. And then the LRDG would pick them up and bring them back. Perfect. It's exactly what you want. So you have your first raid that way. You've got your Lewis bombs. You're planting them on all the, the planes, on the wings of the planes, because that's where the fuel is. The Lewis bombs are, are made with thermite and stuff like that, and incendiary. Burns into the, the, um, the wing, sets the, the plane on fire. Happy days. Now, unfortunately, when Blair went to his particular um, airport, there were more planes than they had bombs. And the men noticed that Blair had gone missing and was seen ripping the control panel out of one of the planes with his bare hands. No mean feat. And it sounds like, well, you know, Blair knew a couple of things. If any one of those planes survived, the Germans and Italians would be straight into them, following his men out into the desert. And he was there to look after his men and make sure they all got back safely. So he had to put every single one of them out of, out of commission, which he did in this case. Okay. But there's also a secondary reason that only came, came apparent recently. And that's the recent physical proof. This is a compass taken out of a CR-42 Italian biplane, ripped out by one RB main. Ripped out for a reason, not just to put the, the uh, particular aircraft out of commission, but he wanted the, the, the compass because you couldn't use an ordinary compass in the desert. They had to use special compasses called Bagnold Sun compasses. I have one, they're fantastic. They're incredibly complicated, but amazing. Amazingly simplistic, but really complicated. I know it's a contradiction, but, but they wanted to see, could they adapt this compass and put it on a Jeep so that they could use it then in the desert, okay? So, you know, yet again, proof that, that Blair made, the antics that people say Blair did, 99% of the time, he did them. Anyway. You'll also have heard the, the story about this, where Blair realised two things. 
you blow up the aircraft, that's fine, but the Germans will replace the aircraft in a split second. Okay, just fly in another fleet in. But if you get rid of the men who fly the aircraft and maintain the aircraft, it takes time to train them. So Blair realised that on the airfield, there was a wee hut, and in the hut, the Germans and Italians had a bit of downtime. So he realised if he went into that room and wiped out every single person in that room, then nobody would be able to chase him and his men across the desert as they escaped. Kill or be killed. Dog eat dog. Well, Blair went over, kicked the door in, and uttered in a quiet Irish voice, Good evening, gentlemen. He then proceeded to kill everybody in the room. Sounds like cold-blooded murder, but no, it's dog eat dog. Anyone survived there in a plane, they're taken off there for chasing his men down, and he's got a whole different thing to worry about. So, I mentioned to you I do this talk all over the place. Okay, and one of the questions I love to do at this stage sounds a bit bloodthirsty, but I'll ask you who would you shoot first? You've just kicked in the door, the room is filled with Germans and Italians who have all pretty much stopped what they're doing. There are weapons in the room, they have access to them. You need to put them out of commission straight away. Who do you shoot first? Feel free to shout it out. The person, who moves first. the person who moves first. Who said that? Good man yourself. You've read the book. Excellent. Because actually at the start of Colonel Paddy, the original Colonel Paddy, a copy of which you've got here, I'd like to leave, I'd like to leave with it as well, but anyway, um, it's the first page. Blair actually tells you how to do this, or rather um, Patrick Marinan has spoken to Blair and, and written it all out. So yes, you kill the first person to move because they've already got over the shock that there's a hulking great big um, SAS guy, ex-rugby player, standing in the doorway and uttering with a, a Northern Irish accent, good evening gentlemen. Who do you shoot second? We're not going to go through them all by the way. <laughs> <laughs> I'm only allowed an hour and I think I've already gone over it. But anyway, so who do you shoot second? I, 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 love, I love your thinking. Your thinking's all fantastic. So the first one you shoot is the first one to move. The second one you shoot is the one closest to you. Because as Blair puts it, um, they're the one who's, who's likely going to embarrass you the most. Because they're not going to miss you. So anyway, do get a copy of Colonel Paddy. It's only in the original Colonel Paddy. But anyway, if you, if you see the WI women, they all get it right the first time. <laughs> anyway, so... For this raid, he got his first award, a DSO, Distinguished Service Order. One down from the Victoria Cross. Fantastic. It's amazing to get one of those. But Blair didn't just get one. In his time in the war, he got four. He was Blair Main, Robert Blair Main, DSO, three bars. That means DSO plus another three DSOs. It's just phenomenal. He was one of only seven other men who got as many commendations in the war. Think of how many men fought in that war. Men and women who fought in that war. And he was from Newton Orange, for dear sake. Anyway, you know, it's the whole Titanic thing again. So, the SAS now got some bad news. Their leader, David Sterling, was arrested, captured by the Germans in a botched raid that should never have happened. Basically, they tried to raid the same place a second time and the Germans were waiting for them. So there was only one person left who could actually take over the SAS because Jock Lewis had been killed in an earlier um, raid. And that was our Blair. Now, what do you think Blair's reaction was to being told, you're the, the chief buck now? Do you think he was, yippee, happy days, I'll knock these guys into the shape I want them? Or, or the alternative, do you think he went in a three-day bender? <laughs> yeah, couldn't take it, couldn't take the, the responsibility initially, but he realised very quickly that without him, the 
the SAS, the, the army was at this stage making them change the beret, was, was fragmenting the SAS into um, the special raiding squadron, the, the, the special boat section, all that stuff, breaking them up. And Blair had to slowly and surely try and pull them back together again, which he did, and he did very successfully. So, the SAS finished their work in, in North Africa. Everything was tickety-boo. They, along with the, um, the 8th Army, they made sure that, that once again, North Africa was in the hands of the Allies. And they moved over to Italy, okay? And they worked their way up through Italy. Blair got another DSO, so he's now on two DSOs, okay? And then into France, German-occupied France, well before D-Day, well before D-Day. So constantly having to move about the place, stay one step ahead of the Germans, okay? By this stage, Blair was being called for meetings and, and being told, you know, you, you can't be up there with your men, you have to be back, uh, you know, commanding properly and all this stuff. And Blair, well, you know what happens, he, he would go, look, let me go. He was banned from, from, from going to France, would you believe? Because they needed him back at headquarters. But at some times he, he persuaded them just to let him go out so as he could have a wee look down to see where his men were when they, the plane flew over France. And God, you know what happened sometimes? He fell out of the plane. <laughs> Yep. Unfortunately, he had a parachute on, and then they couldn't get him for about six months, so as he could go round and see all his men, and he could be with exactly where he wanted to be with his men, uh, because it was so important. So he was now lieutenant colonel as well. Okay. <coughs> Excuse me. Now, you will know about the Victoria Cross and the commendation he got for the Victoria Cross. It was his fourth DSO. Originally, it was accommodation for the Victoria Cross at Oldenburg because not necessarily single-handedly, but with a man in the Jeep with him, he drove out into an area where his men were, were heavily pinned down by German snipers, okay? And he rescued his men one by one in full view of the snipers, and then he went and cleared the, the farmhouse where the snipers were, okay, and he got the commendation for the VC. It was actually signed, sealed, and virtually delivered until one last stroke of a pen somebody put through it and changed it to fourth DSO. If you have an opportunity to call it Newton Ards, call it the library, because in the library we have a copy of the SAS War Diary, and in the SAS War Diary you will see the commendation, okay, that Blair got and the way it's just one strike of a pen, okay? Personally, I think, I'm, I'm in agreement with Blair's brother. Um, there's no point in giving him a VC now. If they couldn't give it to him when he was alive, he wouldn't have wanted it when he was dead. Um, leave him with four DSOs, which is phenomenal. But that's only my opinion. Now, so, war's over. But I'm going to tell you one last SAS story, okay? Because you're all looking at your watches thinking, 10 o'clock, flip. <laughs> anyway, okay, I'll speed this up if you can tell me what TV program that came from. Well, it was based on, if I go like this, second floor hardware stationery, cheap. <laughs> now you're getting it. I don't hear it. Are you being served? Spot on, fantastic, excellent. Okay, why is this here? Well. You'll see in a second. This all takes place in Highlands House in Chelmsford in Essex. Okay, a very fancy house, a bit like Mount Stewart. Lovely gardens and everything. It was owned by Mrs. Hambury. Mrs. Hambury's son was, um, was in the RAF and had been killed. Mrs. Hambury said, if you want to billet the SAS boys here, that's fine. Officers can stay inside the house. The men can, you know, they'll, they'll survive out there. And they did, okay. So, Mrs. Hambury was very chuffed with the SAS. They were, you know, lively bunch, um, incredibly lively bunch. But, at the time, this next story I'm going to tell you, um, they weren't very happy about their relationship with Blair Main. Now, don't try and read this, okay, because I don't put it up there for you to read, right? Um, 
They weren't happy with it then, but they're incredibly happy with it now. And let's see if you can understand why. And it's all to do with this lovely staircase. Blair was walking into the big grand hall at Highlands House with two Americans. And one of the Americans decided, you know what Americans are, any Americans in here before I insult any? <laughs> <laughs> so that's Regent uh, Americans. Anyway, so the American said, uh, in possibly a much better accent than I'm about to do, uh, I bet you can't uh, drive a Jeep up those stairs. And of course, they didn't realize who they were talking to. This is a man who, when somebody said, there's no fresh meat in this tour, look what he did. Right? So, so Blair, he hadn't even finished the sentence. And Blair had disappeared. And he could hear a Jeep being started up outside. And the next thing, the Jeep was driven into the main hall. And didn't he try and drive the Jeep up the stairs? No. Brilliant, except you'll notice a particularly sharp 90 degree tight bend, okay? And that's where the Jeep came to a halt. Now the American, being an American, couldn't just leave it at that. And he said, see, I told you. <laughs> oh no, wrong thing to say. Blair calls down about eight of the SAS guys who are all hanging over the, the, the Bannisters and stuff, you know, whoop wooing. Come down here and lift this Jeep up, and that's exactly what they did. So the Jeep ended up in the, in the upper landing. Now, all the kerfuffle and the yahoos and the shouting and stuff woke Mrs. Hanbury. <laughs> Mrs. Hanbury was none too pleased that uh, she now had a new ornament um, stuck, especially as they couldn't get the Jeep back down the stairs. They had to dismantle it and carry it down the next morning. Well, Mrs. Hambry was, was very annoyed, but thankfully she had a wee soft spot for our Blair, and Blair escorted her back to her room and calmed her down. I'm not gonna say how he calmed her down. You've got an imagination, just leave it at that. So anyway, so you can understand now why at the time they weren't very happy with their association with one Robert Blair Main, but now they love that story. It's fantastic, brilliant. So, a couple of wee things here um, that you'll be able to visit soon because in Newton Ards, there's a museum coming to Newton Ards, a museum called War Years Remembered. It used to be up in Ballyclare, hey? Um, no, that's Ballymena, hey? Uh, Ballyclare. It's now moving to Newton Ards. It'll be open, hopefully, touch wood, 1st of June, okay? So before D-Day. Um, and one of the things you'll see in it, amongst the plethora of amazing war military that, uh, that's in that museum is the SAS shield, okay? The campaign shield made from the wood of the Ulster Monarch. You might recognize the name of the Ulster Monarch as being the, the Belfast Liverpool boat of its day, commandeered by the war office and used by the SAS when they invaded Sicily. You know, another personal wee connection Blair had with, with home, he was, you know, on the Ulster Monarch just made that so special. So anyway, um, I mentioned to you that Blair was a, a, loved his rugby. Um, and I found a couple of wee pictures. Um, this is Blair just having a bit of, bit of, um, bit of rugby, uh, mess rugby really, um, just with the, the lads. There's somebody who's about to get lifted out by one RB main, you know, a man with phenomenal strength. I love this picture here, okay, because who knew that one SAS had a rugby team? <laughs> and would you like to meet them? I wouldn't like to meet them on a dark night, let alone on hell. They were exceptionally special because not only have they got RB Main playing for them, but if you look along the front, you've Adolf Hitler and Charlie Chaplin. <laughs> but anyway, um, how, how they ever got Charlie Chaplin to play, I don't know. It's, uh, <laughs> so anyway, after the war, you have Blair coming back to Sleepy Wee Newton Arts. Literally picked up, you're back, you're back home, get on with life. No support mechanisms, none of that, okay? This is a man who would have tried to settle back into normal life, but considering the previous four years, no chance, no chance. What, a, what would have been going through his mind? He would have suffered from PTSD. I mentioned to you about Damien Lewis. Um, 
and Damien has written two books about Blair, and I thoroughly advise you to get a copy of them. Um, you can get them in the library in Newton Arts if you, <laughs> if you want to. Um, but get a copy, read them. They're phenomenal. They're exceptionally well researched. Um, but Damien sent a copy of his first book, uh, SAS Brothers in Arms, to a specialist in PTSD. I said, read that, tell me, do you think that man had PTSD? And the lady wrote back to him and didn't know anything about who Blair was or anything like that and said, one mission would have given that man PTSD. And he was doing four years worth of behind enemy lines missions. Uh, as we say in the education system, and I, I'm, I would understand some of you not understanding this terminology because you're probably not in the education system at all. Um, but we would say that the PTSD was hanging out of them. Okay, that's, that's a technical teaching term. But anyway, uh, all the teachers, I can see their heads nodding. Yeah, I know exactly what you mean. But anyway, so um, he would have suffered PTSD. He did drink a lot. Now I say there, two reasons. Are we at that stage? Yes, we are. Two reasons for him drinking. It was actually probably about three. The first one was to kill the pain that he carried with him from parachuting. Parachuting, he wrecked his neck and his back. I mean, really wrecked his neck and his back. He was in pain constantly. And after the war, they weren't handing out, you know, tablets like they do these days. Alcohol nulls the pain considerably. So there's one reason he drank. Second reason he drank, PTSD. It curbs the memories as well. What that man had to do, if you think about it, he's at the front the pointy bit of the spear, he's in there killing hand-to-hand -hand combat and he's carrying that with him for the rest of his life. And the alcohol numbed that, gave him a wee bit of respite for a while. But the third and final reason was he liked to drink. He's Irish. It's what we do, allegedly. Anyway, um, so He would rather sit and talk about his rare breed sheep and his chickens and, and his plants. He planted a phenomenal number of rare plants up at Mount Pleasant. And they're all protected now. They're, you can't cut them down, you can't, because some of them are so rare, they're the only ones in Ireland. And they were planted by a man who led the SAS. Just doesn't figure. But he wasn't the recognized war hero that we know him as now. You've got to remember, this was back in the, you know, post-45. Nobody knew a thing about his war record. Well, one or two people did. And this is a bit where not a lot of people know. At the end of the war, he took himself off to Antarctica. Now remember, he was in constant pain from the back injury, the back and neck injury, okay? But he made it to Antarctica. Most people think he got to the Falkland Islands and turned back. He actually made it to Antarctica because that photograph was taken in Antarctica by Blair. Okay, at, let me see, Fort, can you can probably read that better than me, uh, Port Lockery. Okay, but he had to come back straight away. He went with two of his SAS chums, a name you might recognise, Mike Sadler. Mike Sadler just recently died, 103 years of age, an amazing man. He could take you anywhere on the face of this earth. He was the navigator? He was the navigator. Yes, navigated by the stars, by the Bagnall Sun Compass, everything. He was just a natural for it. Um, and yeah, unfortunately, when he, when he died, he was 103, he was blind, but he still supported every, everything that uh, the likes of Damien and stuff did, which was great. Um, so, Blair's injury took him immediately back. He literally set foot in Antarctica and then had to go back when the boat was coming back. Um, such a shame, but, and it was because of this parachute in injury that he carried with him, okay? And it carried with him through his whole life. Here's a picture which, which brings it very much to, to focus. This is Blair being tended to by his mother and his sister. This is a man who led the SAS up against Hitler through into Germany. And there he is being tended to. He couldn't watch, 
He loved football, of all things. Not even a sport, he'll never catch on. But anyway, um, <laughs> he loved football and he couldn't even watch the football because he was in so much pain. Um, at one point, they put a cast on him around his chest and stuff like that. And he found it a bit uncomfortable and cut it off with a set of garden shears. That's the measure of the man. But constant pain, unfortunately. So, a couple of wee last stories and then that'll be us halfway through the talk. Um, <laughs> so, first wee story. Um, he was heading into Belfast, uh, but not in his car. He used to drive a big red Riley sports car, big two and a half litre red Riley sports car. Um, a very powerful machine. He used to drive it apparently like he was in the desert. Most people took one lift off him and that was it. Um, and uh, yeah, so anyway, he didn't have the car this day and he was getting a bus into, into Belfast. So he was at um, uh, Bradford's, uh, Bradford, Bradshaw's Bray getting a bus there and he was talking away to this young lady um, and there was a couple of messers sort of mucking around near the bus stop and the bus arrives and the conductor, remember them, the conductor says, one, one seat up top, so Blair obviously thought the young lady will get the seat, fantastic, but no, the, the, the two nerdy wells, they go rocking up and push past and get the seat. So the bus pulls away from the, the stop, about two, three hundred yards up the road, it's had about 30 miles an hour, you know, and then all of a sudden the boys didn't want to be on the bus anymore, and aided by one big hand from one RB main, the two fellas left the bus, didn't even stop, <laughs> and the girl got her seat. Fantastic. That's a measure of the game. Now, in Newton Ards and round Bangor and stuff, Blair, yes, this, it, it doesn't, you know, this isn't his true story, but he was, he, he did enjoy the odd drink, and he enjoyed the odd night out. And there's a, a universal saying in Newton Ards when somebody six foot two, you know, blocks the doorway when he walks in. Um, it's a greeting that, that they have in Newton Ards. It's, who's your man? Thank he is. I could take him. <laughs> well, Blair had that quite a lot, okay, until people started to realize who he was, you know. And, um, and on this particular night, uh, he was in, in, uh, in Newton Ards at one of the drinking establishments um, and there was a bit of an altercation. So in the police station in Newton Ards there were two, two cops on, on duty, uh, a young rookie and uh, you know, long, long in the tooth, desk sergeant. Phone goes and the young rookie answers the phone. Yes, what's, what, okay, there's a fight, yes, in races, yes, okay, and uh, main you say, right, no problem, we'll be there in two minutes. So he goes to the desk sergeant. Sarge, did you hear that? And the desk sergeant said, what was that name again? He says, Maine. And he says, we'll need more officers. <laughs> so that happened quite a bit, but very quickly they realized that this was a gentleman. Damn it, this was the secretary of the Law Society of Northern Ireland. If you treat him with respect, he'll respond. So what they used to say to him was, Excuse me, Mr. Main, would you put that man down, please? <laughs> and he did, most of the time. On one occasion, he was in Bangor, and uh, somebody had said something that would particularly offended him. And they said, excuse me, Mr. Main, would you put that man down? And he says, I'm not done yet. <laughs> so they uttered four words. Yep, um, you think I would know by now. Uh, four words that reduced this hulking, great, big, Commando, SAS, man who fought against Hitler to very, the very door of Hitler's house, reduced him down to a tiny little schoolboy. What are the four words that would reduce this man? <laughs> Correct. <laughs> I'll ring your mother. Now, the thing was, you see, you got to remember, Blair's mum was was a good Ulster mum. She brought up seven kids, okay? They were all, well, they all respected her. They loved her incredibly. But like every Ulster mum, they were all afeard of her too. Blair didn't want 
his mum to ever know when he had drink on him. This is the man who led the SAS again. Um, he, you, you don't swear in front of his mother. If you used foul language in front of Blair, anyway, he, he hated, abhorred swearing. And this is where the TV program, don't start me on that now. But anyway, but if you swore in front of his mother, you did not end your sentence. So, so you've got that occasion where you've got Blair being reduced to a tiny little man by a mention of this lady here. Not, not big, not tall, but powerful, like every Ulster mum. And Blair meant an awful lot to her, and you'll see in a minute why. Um, but Blair wasn't the golden child. It was actually Doogie, his younger brother, was the golden child who got spoiled and got everything that he ever wanted. But Blair was the one that I think they were proudest of. Well, the, the boy that they were proudest of. So, I'm going to ask you to, to do me a wee favour. I want you to compare uh, and I want you your, to use your judgement as opposed to your knowledge. I want you to look at two pictures here. Here we have a picture of Blair. Um, the first picture was taken outside um, Mount Pleasant by Blair's mate, Bob Bennett. You've seen that picture before. And the second one, you've got a picture of, of Blair handing out prizes at Sports Day at Regent. I want you to tell me what age you perceive the man in that photograph. Never mind what you might know. I want your opinion of what age you think that man is. We're going to have a whole complete show of hands. I'm not going to ask anybody individually. Okay, so have a look at it. The photograph over here of Blair giving the award to John Watson. Okay. Who thinks that is a man in his 70s? Okay. Who thinks it's a man in his 60s? Okay. Now be really careful with this because I'm 53. <laughs> Who thinks it's a man in his 50s? Okay. Who think it's, thinks it's a man in his 40s? There's people who've read books. <laughs> ah, and what the hey? Who thinks it's a person in his 30s? You've heard this talk before. This is a picture of Blair handing out a prize to John Watson in 1949. Do your maths. There's that maths coming in again. 1915 born. He was 34 years of age. Is there anybody in here who is 34 years of age who can stand up without being helped? <laughs> no? Okay, that's good. <laughs> Spot on. So as I say, this was, uh, this was Blair handing out a prize to John Watson, who later became another minister. Um, in, uh, in Newton Arts, and he was 34 years of age. So this is definitely what the severe back injury, the PTSD, the drink, and they're not being able to train, you know. He's, he's lost, the, he's got a paunch, haven't we all? But anyway, um, I wasn't looking at you, sir, swear to God, right? Um, but, you know, it's, it's frightening when you, it, it always brings it to me, how, how that man's life changed entirely. So, I know this because in 1955, 14th of December, he was driving home from being out with, uh, with friends, playing cards, having a drink, and vibing maybe once or twice too often, okay? Driving up towards Newton Ards, and within, a matter of about 300 yards of his home, he was killed in a car accident. We reckon he came round the corner. Um, a wee bit too much, veered onto the other side of the road, hit, there was a truck parked there, it was a, a scrap metal guy had it, okay, um, and bounced off the front of the truck, glanced across the road, and hit a house and got basically had a telegraph pole and got stuck between a telegraph pole and the house. The jar, first of all, from the initial 
Um, collision probably is what killed him. Uh, but he was across the road and then it brought down electric wires which then hit the car. So there was a bit of movement in the body and, uh, and people looked out and they said, oh, he's still alive. Oh, he's going to be really annoyed. And they just left him. And the body was taken away the next morning. Okay. Straight into the, the Ard's Hospital because it was just over a wall to Ard's Hospital. Um, he was killed on the Wednesday and buried on a Friday. Now bear that in mind. Two days after he died, he was buried. And I'm going to show you the funeral, okay, or bits of the funeral. The cortege was a mile long. It took an hour to pass through the town. This is, for those of you who know where Mount Pleasant is in the Scrabble Road, it's just up there. It's just come out and it's down the, the, the road. Okay. For those of you, again, who knew, know Newton Ard's Model Primary School, you can just see the spires of the Model Primary School there. That is a heck of a lot of people to come to a funeral in two days. We couldn't do that now. You couldn't organise a funeral that size with mobile phones and all that stuff. That is how highly the man was regarded within the echelons of the army and the likes. The only person who really didn't come to the funeral, or didn't come to the funeral at all, was David Sterling, but he was in South Africa and he couldn't get across. Um, that just gives you an idea of how well he was respected. He's buried in the cemetery in Newton Ards, Mavilla Cemetery. If you go to Newton Ards, go up to the cemetery, pay your respects, it's easy to find. Go in through the gates, turn left, walk as far as you can, you'll be in the abbey. And in the abbey you'll see the church, sorry, you'll see the, the headstone. Okay. Now I want you to, I mentioned to you about how much his mum thought of him. If you look down towards the bottom, his mum's name is the last name on the headstone. Look when Blair died and look when she died. A matter of two months after he died, most likely of a broken heart. Well, Villa Cemetery is fantastic. If you ever do get to go and visit, visit Blair's grave, certainly. If you go to the opposite corner, it's the, probably the only cemetery in Northern Ireland guarded by two SAS men. Because Billy Hull is in the opposite corner. as Blair. So it's a well-guarded cemetery, you know, if such things can happen. So, how do we know all these things about Blair? Well, we know all these things because of these two people here. Specifically, Fiona. Fiona is Blair's niece, Dougie's daughter, okay? She's phenomenal. Incredibly generous uh, with her time and with her belongings. She was the person who looked after all of Blair's war stuff and the uniform and all that. And she was the one who donated it to War, war Years Remembered to keep it in Northern Ireland because she said that's why it has to stay here. He's from our wee country. So, if you don't know Fiona and what Fiona's credentials are, there's that red Riley sports car and she's standing beside it. The number of fingernails that must have been dug into the dashboard of that car must have been phenomenal. Um, but anyway, she gave us his medals. Now those are his dress medals, the ones he would have worn. Probably he would have been wearing the night that he was out and was killed. Okay, not the big fancy showy ones that are in the SAS regimental headquarters and shouldn't be, but let's not talk about that. Anyway, um, don't anybody ever say I did that. Could we strike that from, anyway. Here's his uniform, amazing. At the bottom of the uniform, you'll see a set of binoculars. Blair loved optical equipment. He loved cameras and things like that. The binoculars are German. Apparently the guy who used to own them didn't need them anymore. <laughs> Blair liked them. Blair, when you think about it, well, one of the things Davy in the museum said, you can think of when, when the young people lift up the binoculars and they're looking through, what sights must Blair have seen, you know, through those binoculars? And what sights must the German who previously owned them seen when he looked over and said, He's very tall, that guy. <laughs> anyway, so if you don't believe me that they're German, look carefully in the, in the lid 
and you'll see 1943, little German swastika up there with the German Imperial Eagle. I made it a bit bigger for those with the uh, bad eyesight. Now, when the museum reopens, this was the museum in Ballyclare. When it reopens, this was the section that, that uh, kept all the Blair stuff. Okay, that's his uniform. <coughs> the uniform was, when he died, his mum wrapped up the uniform in brown paper and put it underneath the water tank. And it remained there. But most of the time, the family didn't know about it. Um, they only found it by mistake when, when they sold Mount Pleasant. And, um, and one of the young lads was trying to get some guns and stuff because he liked old, old guns. And uh, Norman said, there's a couple of guns up in the roost base. Go up and have a look. And the young lad came down and he said, I got the guns. What do you want me to do with these uniforms? And Norman said, what uniforms? Blair's uniform, perfectly preserved. Blair's sister's uniform, Francie's. She was the first female major in the army. She lived in the shadow of her, of her brother, you can imagine. But Davy has them all out on display. Make sure you come. And it's going to be in Newton Ards on the Crawford's Burn Road, 1st of June. From then on, do give him your support and go and find out. Now, this last picture I love. Not because I'm in it, certainly. Not. I don't realise how short I was, but anyway. <laughs> That's me, that's Davy in the green, Davy McCallion, the one who has the, the museum. But it's the two people either end. This man here is Ian McGonagall, son of Ambrose McGonagall, named after his uncle, Blair's best mate, Ian McGonagall. And that chap over there is Patrick McGonagall, Ian's son. And Patrick carries on the mantle. And Patrick's written a book all about the, the McGonagall brothers. And it's fascinating. Absolutely fascinating. So, speaking of books. If you want to find out more details. I have assisted where I could. A man who has become a good friend of mine. And I, I, I don't know I'm living. Because I'm just a wee lad from Temple Patrick. I shouldn't know any of these people. I shouldn't know Ian McGonagall. I shouldn't know Patrick. I shouldn't know Fiona. I shouldn't know Damien Lewis and, and so many others. But it's called Brothers in Arms, like the Dire Straits album. Right? Get a copy of it, it's fantastic. You can get it for a fiver on Amazon. There's a second book as well Forged in Hell. And there's a third book coming too that Damien is working on at the present moment in time. If you want to know the definitive Blair Main history of, in the war, you can't go wrong reading notes. So you've been incredibly patient. I've probably been well over my time. Thank you very much, folks.